This is the Aesthetic Ecosystems Podcast. I'm Ben Hale, your virtual design guide to help you and your family have a healthy, beautiful landscape with less work. What is up and welcome to episode four of the Aesthetic Ecosystems Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about time-saving tactics for your yard. So in the past couple episodes, we talked about having the right mindset for a low-maintenance landscape and also what makes a low-maintenance landscape. So today we're going to get into the specifics, a few areas where you can really focus on to save time in your landscape and enjoy your life more fully. That's right. If you're, if this is your first episode, what we're talking about here is saving time in your landscape and on yard work and reducing the amount of stress and effort you have to spend toward your yard work. You get all that time and all that energy back to do something more fulfilling with that time. Do something more fulfilling with your life. And if that sounds like a stretch, then you have to go and check out my free giveaway, How to Save 27 Hours of Yard Work This Season. This free giveaway, it talks about just three simple habit changes you can make in your typical yard work routine, and it can give you back so much time. And all that time can be spent on doing something more fulfilling, whether it's spending time with your family or pursuing some sort of passion or dream that you have, or just building your life or helping others. All those things really can make an impact and just the simple changes that you can make in your landscape can lead to something amazing. So let's get right into it. I'm going to split what we're talking about today into two specific areas. First, uh, design and establishment of landscapes. So if you're working on a new project or, or maybe doing a complete overhaul of your landscape, or maybe you have a new house you just moved into and and it needs tons of work, and you're basically starting from from step one. So we're going to talk about what things you can do with that design phase to really reduce long-term maintenance needs. And then we're going to go into just the maintenance area. So maybe you already have a yard that you've, you just want to make a change with it. And without completely overhauling certain spaces or the whole yard, there are things you can do with your yard to save time as well. So in the design and establishment phase, we're going to be talking about having the right plants, low maintenance plants, proper planting, planning for the future, and maybe even planting gardens that you only need to work on them twice a year. Yeah, it sounds kind of crazy, but you can do it. Um, considering options for your lawn, as well as uh, naturalized spaces and what they can do for you. So with the design and establishment phase, having the right plants can really make a huge impact. We kind of talked about this in episodes two and three of what makes a low maintenance landscape. The right plants are basically plants that are properly adapted to the conditions of your garden. So If you're talking, and this could be to your lawn, having the right type of grass that you plant in your lawn can make a huge difference in whether or not it needs to have tons of work of keeping up fertility or uh, removing disease problems or having the right amount of water. So selecting the right type of grass for your yard is very important. So make sure you know what right conditions there are, whether it's for your lawn or for a garden that you're planting. Make sure you know what's what's the amount of moisture you're getting in that specific space. So you can look at your average rainfall per year and how it happens seasonally. So do you have tons and tons of rain in one part of year and then it's dry the rest of the year? Or is it pretty well spread out? Um, these can make huge differences as to whether or not, for one, the drought resistance of your plants. Two, whether or not they're going to have issues with uh, mold and mildew in wet seasons, things like that. So you need to make sure the plants are adapted to the conditions. So aside from water, you also have uh, the right amount of sunlight in your space, uh, the right amount of soil fertility, all sorts of things like that, that you need to make sure that the plant you're considering is adapted to that specific space. And when I'm talking about the specific space, there's multiple factors that goes into that. There's the, the overall climate of your area or your region. So this is your USDA hardiness zone. If you're not familiar with that, uh, the 
the USDA came out with this chart um, quite a few years ago, and essentially it, it breaks out uh, the specific regions of the United States uh, based on the how cold it gets in the winters and whether plants can survive that condition. So some plant you plant in Florida might not be able to survive the winter in Ohio, where I live, and vice versa. You might have something that uh, thrives in Ohio with the colder winters and the, the, the hot summers, but with the long, hot summers in Florida, it might not have the right amount of heat resistance or sun resistance uh, that something in Ohio might have. So it's important to make sure your plant is adapted to your region based on that hardiness zone and and other large climactic areas like that. So the general moisture of your region, but then also drilling down specifically to the specific space you're intending to plant this plant. So you might plant a plant on one side of your house and it does great, and you might plant it the same exact plant on the other side of your house and does horribly. And this could be based on how much sun it's getting, how much heat it's getting uh, at different times of year, uh, the moisture level. So the specific area of your yard can make an impact too. So make sure you consider both the overall climate area as well as the specific microclimate of your space. Okay, so that's enough on the right plants as far as the right conditions. Also consider potentially low maintenance plants. And what I mean by low maintenance plants, they're plants that don't require a lot of resources and inputs in general. Some plants are really beautiful, uh, popular uh, garden plants, but unfortunately they require a lot of tending to keep uh, either trimmed or well fertilized or or well fed and to keep looking pretty. So when you consider plants, Think about the long-term maintenance of this plant and whether, you know, to keep an attractive plant, does it need trimming every year? Do you need to prune it to keep it to a certain size? What sort of fertility does it need? So it doesn't require fertilization every single season to bloom or something like that. And focus on the plants that don't require all those inputs, that just naturally, once they're established... They just take care of themselves. And that's really great when you're talking about a low-maintenance landscape and wanting to save time. So now that we've selected the right plants for your space, as well as plants that are low-maintenance and don't require tons of inputs in the long term, let's consider the right type of planting. So make sure you're, you're establishing your plant properly so it gets a good footing in its new space and is able to thrive once it's well established. Now, I'm gonna be honest here. When it comes to planting and establishment, this phase is very important. It's kind of like like raising a kid, right? The most intensive part of a child's life is the first few months when it's first learning to grow, be part of the world, crawl, all sorts of things, eat, right? All sorts of things. Well, a plant is the same way. And if you're transplanting an already a potted plant or something that's already been growing somewhere else, it needs that same nurturing and care in its new space. Because essentially what you've done is you've uprooted the plant, you've pulled its its foundation out, right? And it's most likely lost a lot of its roots, uh, very f- small fibrous roots, and and it's been growing in a specific condition. And then you're placing it in your yard, which is um, most likely a very different soil condition, and it has fewer roots to, to keep growing off of, and it might not even be the ideal time that you're planting it. So properly taking care of that plant once you put it in the ground is very important for the first couple weeks to even maybe a few months. And once it's able to get started and take hold and take root, then it's usually able to thrive as long as you've selected the right plant for the right place and all that. When it comes to proper planting, there's a few specific things, and and based on the type of plant you're talking about, there's certain nuances that that differ. But in general, what you want to do is usually you want to plant during the dormant phase of your plant, ideally. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't do it at other times, but you just might have less success, or you might have to take care of it a bit more. So, for example, for a, a small tree that you might be transplanting from, say, a pot or burlap or whatever, 
The ideal time for that is late fall, generally speaking, through very early spring before the buds open. This is the time when the upper growth of the tree is dormant. And if you plant it in late fall, the roots will actually continue to develop over the winter as long as the ground's not frozen. So this gives the plant time to really establish before that burst of growth during the next growing season when it's trying to take off and compete with other things around it. Making sure you take care of the roots when you're planting, spreading the roots out before you fill in the hole, and also making sure you're planting at the right depth where you don't want to plant below where the plant is already growing because especially for trees and shrubs, this can cause quite a bit of damage and even kill the plant potentially. So there's a lot of other details, but uh, taking care of the roots, making sure um, you do it at the right time of year and follow it up by a, re- a good watering sequence. So make sure you're not, depending upon the plant, make sure you're giving it the right amount of water. So this could mean if it's a plant that's adapted to low moisture conditions or average moisture conditions, don't overwater it. And vice versa, if it's a plant that requires a certain amount of water, make sure you're giving it enough moisture at a good frequency of deep watering uh, to help it get established. And eventually you you hopefully can kind of um, wean the, the plant off of the water, so slowly reduce the watering frequency and quantity so the plant can begin to establish on its own. Okay, enough about planting techniques. The next thing you want to do, well, hopefully you do this before planting, is plan for the future growth of the plant. I see this happen all the time, and it drives me crazy driving down the street or walking down through a neighborhood And I see people plant trees, especially trees is where the biggest problem is, right underneath the power line or or, or right over an access point that is going, it's inevitably going to cause problems in the future when when this tree grows bigger, it, it needs to be trimmed through the power line or even topped, completely cut off at the top. And that's just a, such a difficult problem because If you had planted that plant just in a slightly different location, it would be able to grow freely. Similarly, making sure you're spacing your plants properly for growth. A lot of times people, um, I I see it all the time in new shopping centers where they take these beautiful maples and they'll plant them at about uh, 10 foot spacing. Well, a maple tree, once it matures, it grows upwards of 70 feet and with a a branch spread almost as wide and these trees aren't able to grow in such proximity to each other. So inevitably what you have to do after a few years is end up cutting down some of those central trees to space them out. So make sure you plan for the future um, both with the branches uh, and also with the roots. So you don't want to plant right in your your leach field of your septic system. You don't want to plant right over um underground wires or uh, in, incoming uh, gas or electric or um, water lines because the roots will inevitably disrupt that um, those utilities. Similarly, you don't want to plant right next to your driveway where the roots are going to grow underneath the driveway and break up your concrete. Or also... <laughs> One additional piece is your foundation. A lot of people love planting close to the foundation. It looks real nice. Selecting the right plant to do that is very important because if you select a plant where the roots spread out, they're going to attack your foundation. It's going to cause problems either with settling or with disruption of the foundation itself. So another cool thing you can do is kind of reach a target goal when you establish a new garden space that it might only need work twice a year. How cool would that be, right? You can just totally forget about it during the peak summer when you're just trying to relax and not get too warm outside and vice versa. In the winter, you can just kind of leave it alone and it actually looks nice at the same time. So when I mean twice a year, you do it one day in the fall one day in the spring, and that's it. You can totally leave it go the rest of the year. Now, it's kind of a stretch goal, but it is possible. And there's certain factors to consider here. I actually have a a cool article on this. If you go to aestheticecosystems.com slash 2xgarden, that's the number two letter X, garden, for twice a year garden, 
I talk all about this and it's it's some really cool stuff to consider if you're considering planting a new garden or a totally new yard uh, definitely check it out and I'll have a link in the show notes as well if you want to go there so some tips real quick on this is make sure you have good fertility when you establish it because that fertility really helped the plants you establish there right when they're getting adapted to the new location that fertility will help them really have a boost to develop roots, get anchored, and start growing well without any sort of issues with disease or competition or anything else. Dense plantings, and while you're you know, planning for mature growth of your plants, making sure you plant densely enough to where there's not massive space in between for weed competition, but not overcrowding them at the same time where the plants are competing with themselves and becoming weakened. So finding that right space where you have plants that are covering most of the area once they're growing out and maybe even consider some short-term plants in between if there's going to be too much time for them to grow out and allow space for weeds. Again, going back to the whole low-maintenance plant concept, When it comes to a garden that you only want to deal with twice a year, you definitely need low-maintenance plants. So these are plants that are well adapted to your region, don't require tons of fertility long-term, and are able to uh, adapt to a wide range of conditions. So that's a wide range of soil conditions, a wide range of sun conditions, and a wide range of moisture conditions uh, specifically. So... Those are a few points as far as if you want to have a garden that you take care of twice a year. Again, go check out more at aestheticecosystems.com slash 2xgarden or click the link in the show notes. Now, when it comes to your lawn, there's this is going to sound crazy probably, but I really want you to consider it. And that is consider clover. Now, a lot of people have spent the past uh, 60 years trying to eradicate clover from their lawns, but before that, it was actually a prized part of people's lawns. The reason I'm suggesting clover for your lawn is it's a type of plant that fixes nitrogen, and if you are not familiar with it, essentially what it does is the plant, as it grows, it produces nitrogen in its roots through a process where it interacts with bacteria. It's super cool stuff. I could probably spend like 20 minutes talking about it, but I won't. So essentially, it produces its own fertilizer. Nitrogen is a required nutrient in the soil for plants to grow and develop. And so by fixing its own nitrogen in the soil, it takes care of itself. And when you're growing it alongside of your grass, inevitably some of that nitrogen escapes from the clover and helps your grass grow. So if you have a beautiful lawn with interspersed bits of clover through it, kind of loosely spread out through it, it actually will help fertilize your lawn and keep it greener and growing more healthily and more disease resistant. So it's kind of a, you know, a touchy subject for a lot of people, but I strongly ask you to consider it because of what it can do for your lawn and how much time it can save you during the maintenance routine of your lawn. One last bit here, when you're considering establishing a garden, consider planting a naturalized space. This is becoming really popular on in commercial landscapes where they can look really beautiful, even though they're kind of, you know, a little rugged looking, they actually are almost like a breath of fresh air on your landscape. This is a space where it might be um, some grasses kind of looking like a meadow or a prairie, or it could even be a, you know, a a loose tree planting or something that is a semi-natural landscape. The great thing about these landscapes is they feel natural or they look natural, and so they are a great way to escape from the clean-cut landscape feel of typical urban and suburban areas. And they also require very little work to maintain. There's usually only, if you're talking about a prairie planting, there's very little you need to do. Occasional cutting of it about once a year. um, And over multiple years, you might be reseeding over the top of it with a few uh, plants to maintain it. But that's generally it. And other than that, it attracts tons of wildlife. So you get uh, the beautiful sound of birds in your garden space. And 
it kind of just leaves that space to go and take care of itself and provide a lot of beauty for you. So really consider that. Is there a space you hardly touch in your landscape except for when you have to mow it or weed it or whatever that you could transition to a more naturalized space that can provide you a lot of beauty and save you a ton of work at the same time? So with that, let's get into some some maintenance tips and maybe you already have your landscape established. Maybe you inherited it or it is your landscape that you built, but now you're really looking at, okay, I'm spending too much time on my landscape chores. How can I save that time with maintenance to free up more time for myself? We already talked uh, in previous episodes about having the right mindset, which really makes a difference. So I'm not going to touch too much on that, but I'm going to assume that you're making the priority that your life is more important than your yard work. And while it seems foolish, again, I just want to give a wake up call that I think when you say those words to most people, they would say, oh yeah, my life is way more important than my yard. But then I see so many people messing up their schedules and their priorities with going to mow the lawn or pull weeds or whatever. And, and I, I really think our actions are not in line with our priorities. So make sure your actions are in line with your priorities and that you're prioritizing your life first and your family first. So a couple tips here. The first bit is to increase time between your maintenance routines. Do you really need to go out there and cut the grass when you think you do? Do you really need to go pull weeds when you think you do? Maybe, maybe you do. But most likely, I'd be willing to bet if you let your yard go another few days that it wouldn't be the end of the world. And so I suggest you just to try it and spread things out just a little bit more. And what that does is you then have to mow less frequently. You have to pull weeds less frequently. And that little stretch there can make a difference over the long term. So if you go and mow your yard weekly, try it every two weeks. See what happens. I've done this experiment on our own yard. And yes, there are times where mowing every two weeks is just a little too far out and your yard starts to look a little too shaggy. So you can't always do it. I'll be honest. But think about the times when your yard's not growing like gangbusters and maybe when it's starting to just pick up or starting to slow down, try and spread that mowing frequency out a little bit more. And same with your weeding habits. When it comes to your maintenance routine, consider carving out larger blocks of time at a less frequent basis. So what I mean is if you go out and you maybe you spend like maybe an hour or two just kind of relaxing and pulling weeds at the same time, consider maybe doing it in a longer chunk. So it might be a, a, a chunk of your weekend uh, that you don't have plans, but then do it less frequently. So by doing this, you batch out the, chunk, the type of work you're doing and you don't have to do it as often because you're getting more done at one time. This allows you to to get momentum, get focus, and get it done, and then have it be out of the way for quite some time. So consider batching out your work. When we're talking about mowing specifically, we already talked about trying to stretch out that time. So do it a little bit less often. And what you can also do is try mowing a little bit higher and see what happens. By mowing higher, you're actually increasing the health of your lawn. It seems a little counterintuitive at first, maybe, because we're so used to cutting a nice short lawn. But think about it. Grass is adapted from a prairie plant. And generally, prairies grow at three to six or even more feet high. And so the grass blades we have in our yard, when we're cutting them at two to three inches, we're really stunting the ability of those grass plants to grow like they naturally do. Now, I'm not suggesting you go let your lawn grow to two feet high or anything, but raise your mower a little bit because when you have taller grass, there's more foliage to your grass, which means more photosynthesis for your grass blades. This, in turn, creates more energy for the plant, gives it more roots, which gives it healthier grass. So overall, your grass plant becomes healthier when you just raise the height just a little bit 
and allows it instead of being in a starvation phase when you're chopping all the the growth off the grass is really struggling to grow back so it can store up some energy and thrive and so you're allowing the top to grow you're allowing the roots to be a little bit stronger this makes it more disease resistant and surprisingly the grass will go slower as well so because the grass is happier with a little bit more height it also doesn't feel like it has to grow as fast to catch up and survive so it's less of a st- uh, starvation and survival response and more of a nurturing habit when you raise the the height of your mower so really interesting there you might not like it but i really suggest you give that a try and now i'm going to move on to one last bit here and this is a really important one and again i'm kind of pushing for a little bit of change here for some of you and that's okay consider stop fertilizing your lawn that might sound a little weird again because hey if i'm fertilizing it i get a bunch of green in my yard doesn't that mean it's healthier well yes and no when you give a bunch of sugar to a kid they get a ton of energy right they grow they (laughs) not grow but they run around like crazy they do all sorts of crazy stuff but then they crash right then they're done they're toast they get that get all crazy and whiny and stuff. I don't know this from experience, of course, but um, <laughs> fertilizer is similar to sugar for a kid. So it, it really gives us quick burst of energy. It makes the grass feel healthy for a short bit of time and it grows like crazy. It turns bright green, but then it needs it more and more and more. So it's like an addiction piece. It gives it this, this, burst of growth but then it needs it again and again and again and again and so this chemical dependency actually is bad for the plant it reduces its root growth and while you get a ton of foliage with the reduced root root growth the plant is less healthy because it can't support the rate of growth of the foliage top and so you end up with a weakened plant that's more disease prone and less healthy overall And I don't want that for your yard. I'm sure you don't want either when you hear what it actually does. And so there are a lot of other options as far as getting healthy grass. The first is, again, cutting it a little bit higher so your plant is a bit healthier to begin with. In addition, if you really do need some nutrients for your soil, consider some more organic options like compost. Compost, uh, especially when you mix it a little bit with some topsoil and spreading that out in your yard, Maybe, you know, over a course of a few years, you might do it um, uh, twice a year, and it will really make a huge difference in the health of your lawn. So consider some healthier options for your yard and try and cut the chemical dependency because while it's not only healthy for your grass, it's not healthy for you as well. That's why when you put stuff down on your lawn, they say, you know, all the professionals, they put down those signs that have the weird circle with the person and the dog in it because it's not healthy for you it's not healthy for your kids it's not healthy for your pets and it's not healthy for your grass so consider aside from the health reason also for just the the maintenance reason consider stopping using chemical fertilizers and using uh some if you need to use something some healthier options that actually support the health of your grass and the soil beneath it So that's going to wrap it up for today with the maintenance routine as well as the design and establishment routine when you consider time-saving tactics for your yard. Again, real quick, when you're talking about design, considering the right plants for your space and considering low-maintenance plants when you're designing a garden, using the right planting techniques to really give it a good start, planning for the future growth of your plants, planting gardens that potentially only need work twice a year, considering using clover in your lawn to self-fertilize it, and planting a naturalized space that really takes a, a resource drain type of space where maybe you're maintaining it but you don't ever use it, well transition it to something that is maybe more naturalized that can take care of itself covers a, a, a good amount of space in your yard and looks really beautiful at the same time. When it comes to maintenance, 
Try increasing the time between your maintenance routine so you don't have to do it as often. Also, when you do work on your yard, try to do it in more sizable chunks and then less frequently. So you're getting more done at once and then you can wait longer. When you're mowing, while you're doing it less often, also try cutting higher a little bit and increasing the health of your lawn. And to finish up, consider stop fertilizing your lawn with chemicals so you're not decreasing the health of your grass and instead use something that would increase the health of it. So that's it for today, guys. Make sure you go over to the show notes for any of the links I talked about today. If you want to save time right now on your yard, consider going to aestheticecosystems.com slash 27 hours. That's 27 HRS. And get a free guide to help you save 27 hours in your yard just through simple habit changes. Okay, now it's time to talk about the launch party, guys. Uh, excuse me, not party, but parte. Uh, the launch parte is for the first two months of the show from March 11th through May 11th, 2018. I want to have some fun uh, to help spread a wor- spread the word about the show. Uh, I really appreciate your enthusiasm and interest in this show, and I want to get you guys involved and have some fun while we're doing it. So this is a chance to have some fun, to uh, for us to get connected, uh, to win some prizes, and And uh, let's talk about the prizes before we talk about what we're doing. So what are the prizes? Weekly, I'm offering a free consultation with me, Ben Hale, which is normally a $99 value. So uh, one person each week uh, that gets involved in the launch parte uh, gets a free consultation. I'm also giving away... A free offer for one of my ebooks, 10 Ways to Get More Beauty with Less Work, which is a $19 value. Uh, next, the grand prize. There is only one of these we're giving away through this whole launch party. So at the end of the launch parte, the Organic Lawn Care Manual by Paul Tukey. So Paul Tukey himself has offered to give away one free book to a lucky winner uh, that's getting involved in this launch party. Uh, And this book is all about how to manage a healthy lawn from anything from a golf course style lawn to your uh, low maintenance lawn, which of course is something I prefer here on this show, right? I own this book. I've read this book multiple times. I've given it away. It's a kind of a a tattered and worn version that I have. Um, And uh, I, I, I use some of these practices in my own lawn. So I I love this book and I highly um, promote it as well. And you'll hear me talk about it throughout the show. Uh, But Paul Tukey has been kind enough to offer a copy of his book as a grand prize. And there's also a special surprise for everybody that's... uh, going to be getting involved in the launch parte. The Rolling River Nursery out of California has offered a, a special surprise for everybody that's involved. The Rolling River Nursery is a, a USDA certified organic nursery. So I went online and I looked around for nurseries that have online availability shipped through the continental US and have some great offerings. And Rolling River Nursery has been kind enough to become involved with our launch parte. And they're not only are they online availability, but they also are certified organic, which means they don't use any harmful herbicides or pesticides that you have to be concerned with your family about. And so what you're getting is a safe and healthy plant. They also offer a ton of edible plants and trees and shrubs, cacti and succulents. So um, they offer several trees and shrubs that are adaptable throughout the most of the United States. So definitely worth checking them out. And in addition, these guys are also involved with a, uh, a nonprofit in Southern California to help local food movements called plantingjustice.org. So if you want to learn more about them, uh, you can go to rollingrivernursery.com. And I also want to give a shout out to uh, Paul Tukey's website, uh, for his organic lawn care manual and his other works is paultukey.com, P-A-U-L-T-U-K-E-Y. And uh, to sum up, guys, okay, you want to learn how to get involved with this uh, launch party? Go over to aestheticecosystems.com slash pod launch. And that's P-O-D-L-A-U-N-C-H. There's a link in the show notes. Um, and that's that's going to give you all the instructions on how to get involved. Uh, there's two ways specifically to get involved. One is through uh, sharing with your uh, peeps on Facebook. And the other is through leaving a review on iTunes. Both of these are going to help spread the word about the show and get other people, other friends listening to it as well. And I uh, sure appreciate your help here. And and likewise, uh, this is going to be a fun time. So, uh, so go on over and to Aesthetic ecosystems.com slash pod launch to get involved.
As always, thanks for tuning in and make sure you live with passion and make tomorrow better than today.